Hello, Malaysia, and welcome to another edition of Medical Today with me, Jared Rutnam. And on this week's episode, once again, we begin the show with uh, Dr. Navin, uh, better known as Dr. Navin Janagaswaran at the Global Doctors. He's the group medical director from Global Directors, who joins us on a weekly basis to talk about aging and well-being. So we'll start it off today with demystifying the myths of aging and uh, who better to talk about it than our very important man yes. of the first segment on a weekly basis. Yep. Dr. Navin, thank, thank you very you much very for joining much. us. Well, uh, today we've got a <coughs> lot to talk about. We've got not enough time, but too yes. much to talk about. So we're going to, to uh, debunk myths today, yeah? Yeah. Uh, myths about aging. Now, where do we start with this? So uh, you've given us a list of 12, yep. and you're going to explain these 12 myths to us. So let's start with um, this one. People should expect to deteriorate mentally and physically. Yeah. Uh, I think that's true. It's true. Mm. It's true. It's inevitable. Mm. We will grow old. We will definitely grow old. Our bodies will become smaller. Our muscles become weaker. But it's all to do with keeping it in the mindset. Right. Keeping it active. Work on it. Exercise. We've already talked about strength training. We talked about keeping ourselves mentally fit. We keep ourselves active at work. And then take your medicines correctly chronic hydration, you've got to drink well, eat well, and keep all the portions. But, but there's just so much to think about, you know. You really, do you need to have a checklist just to get yourself into the routine? Not really. You just have to look at it from the overall perspective mm -hmm. of healthy. And it cannot start when you're 80 years old. Right. It has to start when you're in the 40s itself. Mm -hmm. Everything starts in the 40s from the press biopia and you're seeing the ophthalmologist right. bifocal mm -hmm. so we should start it in the 40s uh, from there let's move to the uh, this other one most older people have similar needs is that true yes but yes and no because not every not all one cloth can cut for everybody so different people will have different needs different people will have different wants so it'll be varying from person to person depending on the need mm -hmm. some would need a stick some would need a support some might not need a support depending on how well they have built themselves used their muscles and how much of food again nutrition and how they have taken care some will be more frail at a different age group because there is something called as chronological age which is by the calendar there is something biological by the cellular structure and the last one is psychological mm -hmm. which is up here so right. if we keep ourselves remember that Forget the number and work on your age of what you want to do, then you're perfectly good. But we seem to, in, in our society, <laughs> we seem to push the, se uh, the seniors away too quickly, uh, too, too fast, too hard. Like, you know, th there's one saying, mm -hmm. um, which is always used, creativity and making a contribution is the province of young people. Yeah. Not yes and no. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, I think we were just talking about this. You see, technology has brought us YouTube. But you know, if you give a button and a, and a shirt for an old younger person, he'll have to go to YouTube and look at how to stitch it. But the older generation knows how to do it. If you go down to the kitchen and if you go to your aunties and uncles, they will know what to take out of the kitchen and cook a food. We need to go to YouTube and look at what, what are the ingredients you need to buy from the supermarket. So these varies from person to person. So it doesn't matter whether younger or older, it's mm -hmm. still the same. Now, the, uh, this one we always hear a lot, and you mm -hmm. hear it too. The experience of older people has little relevance in modern society. And mm -hmm. now, even before you hit your 50s, you're known as old these days. You know? uh, it's all how you, it's a matter of speech, mm -hmm. how people look at us and how they feel about it, more than what's in your mind. I think it's all, again, coming back to your mindset, basically. Mm -hmm. So is there any truth in this, that the, the younger people know more uh, I mean, in, in modern society, older people have, have little relevance. Actually, the experience that the older person can give you is far much more superior than what the younger person could. Mm -hmm. The older person could give, give you a lot of experience. They've gone through the journey and they have experienced it, whereas the younger person could not give you that experience. Let's take, for example, communication. We are in the era of where people have used um, pages and come to analog and mm -hmm. then come to Android. I remember those good old days. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then it beeps on your phone. But nowadays things are different. People have all gone straight to Android and they can't live without their phone and their Facebook. People communicate by phones. People communicate by speech. 
here now you use emails and now you use WhatsApp. Things have changed, mm -hmm. but the evolution, we, the older generation understands the whole evolution process, right. which is far much better. Now here's another one. Many older people want to be left in peace and quiet. Uh, yeah, I think many of them would like that. But it again, I would say it varies from person to person. If you look at it and see the elders of our, or in our community, Tun Daim, Tan Sri Zeti, Robert Koch, they could have all sat down where they were. They all came forward because they needed to do something. Their advice is the one that's the engine behind the whole country right now. So why do you need it? Because they needed to fix something that no one else could do it. Mm -hmm. So I would say you need them in the system, They're keeping them in quiet and peace. There was a gentleman, John Glenn, who was 40 years when he flew to space, uh, when he was 40 years old. Then when he's 77, he flew again to mm -hmm. space. Is because they needed his help to go around the orbit of the Earth, you know? Right. Uh, so we're talking about uh, demystifying or debunking myths about the older generation of aging right here on Medical Today with uh, Dr. Navindra Nagaswaran. Moving into the next one, hospital beds and nurses are the main issue. What does that mean? It is, it's very true because you see, as, we, as the population grows older, the need for beds, using the beds, you see each hospital will have about 200 to 300 beds. But if you have um, the beds occupied for a longer number of days, recovery is slower. They, they will pick up hospital infections faster. Their resistance is poor. Need, they need more human resource. They need nurses, mm -hmm. more support to go to the toilet because they're more frail. Fall risk is higher. So automatically the utilization becomes higher. Right. So keeping them independent is very important mm -hmm. all the time. Let's know. go to these ones very quickly. Providing for older people takes away resources from younger people. I, I really, I, I don't think that's I true. I don't think it's true because mm. actually providing it to actually give you like safety. Re remember we discussed on the environment, you told about the church, you told about the walk path. If you do all that, even a young child can walk on the same path. Mm -hmm. Wheelchair access doesn't mean that it's only for the old. Right. It's also for a disabled or an able kid to actually use the facility. Mm -hmm. So Something it does that, that also comes in as a myth. This is shocking to probably our society. Spending on older people is a waste of resources. I don't think it's a problem with uh, the Asian society. Do you think so? Uh, or am I generalizing here? I think probably it's being generalized. The thing is, Spending it, like for example, you give spectacles, you give hearing aid, you give gadgets to them, you actually keep them healthy. When you keep them healthy, the overall healthcare cost comes down. Mm -hmm. Like currently in Malaysia, we are facing with this NCD as a big problem. Right. So the older generation would spend more on it. But if you treat them when they're younger, then this whole process will be far much more uh, budgeted mm -hmm. and m less less expenses. Okay, then. the next myth talks about older people not being suited to modern workplaces. What say you? I think uh, yes, they are not suited mm -hmm. very well, but they are a need. How would you look at it? Like for example, the environment that we live, open offices, open spaces, where chairs are much different from where they sat. But if you look at it and see from where they came from and you follow what they used to do, actually it's a far much more better environment. Right. This I, I really don't agree with because I train dogs. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. You can, actually. You can. I yeah. do agree with you. Yeah. You can definitely teach old dog new tricks mm -hmm. uh, because it depends what trick you're teaching. If you're going to teach them something that have no relevance to them, then the fact, the myth, the myth is correct. Mm -hmm. But if you can teach them something that's going to be useful, like mobile phones, they all move from analog to Android, you know, to use your finger rather right. than press the button. So that, that'll answer that. Uh, how do you explain this? Older people expect to move aside. I don't quite understand this myth here. Older people are supposed to give way. They're supposed to move aside for this. But like I just mentioned just now, if you move aside, the example that I gave you, the council of the elders, mm -hmm. the council of the elder people here. Mm -hmm. Why do we need them? If they move aside, what would who will be actually fixing all the problems? We'll be left to scratch Singapore, our heads. Singapore, Malaysia, they all use the council of the elders, which is important for us, you know. Mm -hmm. 
Dr. Nawin, we've got one more myth uh, to debunk before we take a quick break. Yeah. Things will work out for themselves. What do you have to say about this? I think things will w won't work out if we don't assist and if we don't guide and we don't put it correctly. So we need to give them training, we need to teach them and we need to put that correctly. If you don't, things doesn't really work out by itself. It will become, it will become, uh, how do I say it, it will become very, very dangerous and will become uh, a, a big problem for the society itself. Right. Yeah. Well, uh, Dr. Navindra Nagaswaran, always a lot of help for us right here on Medical Today, uh, coming in to talk about uh, myths of aging or debunking, demystifying the myths of aging. Thank you very much, no Doc. Problems. It was a pleasure having you on yeah. the show. We'll have him back next week once again right here on Medical Today. We'll be back just after a short break. Stay with us. a vision correction number but I'm more than a number when I'm not enjoying my little sunshine I'm enjoying my city's modern architecture my Eslaw lenses go beyond my correction their creasel technology shields my eyes from reflections scratches and smudges for optimal clarity I'm more than a number I'm a crystal clear catcher of the perfect image see more do more Essilor. ask your eye care expert for advice I have a vision correction number, but I'm more than a number. When I'm not sharing ideas with my colleagues, I'm defending my kingdom on the back of a dragon. My eyes and lenses go beyond my correction. They keep my eyes relaxed to stay focused and protect me from harmful blue light. I'm more than a number. I'm the never tired dragon eye. Eyes in. Ask your eye care professional. See more. Do more. Essilor. Hello and welcome back to Medical Today. Jared Rutnam with you. After debunking myths with Dr. Navin, we now move into eye health. And joining me in the studio is Mohammad bin Juso, CEO of OptoCare Group. And he's here to talk about eye protection for better eye health. Mohammad, thank you very much for joining us. It's a pleasure to have you with us right here on Medical Today. Now, uh, let's talk about eye protection. When we talk about eye protection, for better high eye health. Now, what are we referring to? Thank you for inviting me to this program today. Uh, every day our eyes uh, work very hard to carry out our daily tasks. Uh, we receive uh, approximately 80% of information uh, from our eyes. Then we want our vision to be free from uh, from the light glare which come from uh, the sun and uh, or come from uh, headlights uh, of oncoming cars. But our major concern is about harmful uh, UV light and harmful uh, blue light which uh, come from uh, the uh, which come from the sun and also from our digital devices. Uh, this can cause uh, digital eye strain and uh, lead to get uh, irritation, uh, dry eyes, and eye fatigue. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, do a lot of people complain about that? I know a lot of people complain about dry eyes all the time. Yeah. Uh, and why, why do you think people are complaining about dry eyes? Uh, dry eyes cause when they, uh, they, they uh, use uh, the device a lot, digital device a lot, they tend to not blink the eyes. So mm -hmm. we, we have to blink the eyes, then uh, the tears layer we, we, we come up. Right. Now, uh, in, in your practice, do you see younger and younger people coming in to get their eyes tested and to get a pair of eyeglasses all the time? Yeah, not necessary, but some is complaining about 70% uh, of consumer experience of tight eyes. Mm -hmm. 
from uh, prolonged usage of a digital device. Right. Uh, but they are unaware of discomfort and the hazard from uh, blue light. Mm -hmm. uh, prolonged uh, exposed to the harmful uh, blue light can damage the retina. Then we uh, then uh, lead to get a macular degeneration, mm -hmm. which for long term can lead to blindness. And majority of consumer are sensitive to the light, but they are concerned of damaging uh, UV to their eyes. Right. Right. So now, now uh, let's talk about the protection which is available uh, for eye health. What is in the market currently? Uh, there are three types of protection uh, in market currently. One is a uh, spectacle with a uh, with a uh, lens coating that filter harmful UV and uh, blue light, and then uh, second is a spectacle with a photochromatic lens uh, that this lens can change color, is turn to darker when it exposed to the uh, UV light, and then of course the third one is uh, sunglass as well. Can do can protect our eyes. Without this uh, protection, our exposed to the harmful UV and blue light. Uh, a significant uh, consumer, uh, we uh, have claimed uh, their eyes to be sensitive to the light and suffer from uh, visual uh, visual fatigue. Right. Uh, when you talk about photochromic lenses or transition lenses, yeah. how does it work? Uh, photochromics come from two works. Uh, one is photo, uh, refer to light, and chromic, uh, refer to colors. Basically, uh, it is a lens with the ability uh, to change color automatically uh, from clear to dark color. Uh, dark color depends on uh, changing of uh, light condition and uh, UV exposure. This lens provides full UV protection and uh, uh, protection for uh, blue light as well. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, this lens uh, available in many colors, so uh, such as a uh, gray color, a uh, graphic green, and brown amber. And then this uh, th this color offer the consumer. Uh, as a fashion eyewear also. Mm -hmm. But uh, very interesting here is when you talk about photochromic lenses or transition lenses, when you move out into the light or into the sunlight, it starts to get darker. Yeah. When you come into the dark, it lightens. Yeah. But what happens if you're driving, uh, you're driving in the sun and then you get go into a tunnel like the menorah tunnel, uh, it darkens straight away. Okay. Uh, photochromic lens uh, contains colorless molecule that darken due to uh, UV light energy. Mm -hmm. uh, it is clear lens uh, that change into darker to provide comfort and protection. But uh, the changing, the duration changing uh, from clear to dark is take shorter hour, shorter shorter time compared to a dark to clear. Mm -hmm. Of course, when you driving on the daylight under the hot sun. Uh, normally, uh, it's the, the the lens is dark, uh, but when you go to the tunnel, it's not automatically changed to the clear. Mm -hmm. But uh, when normally uh, when you use a, a photochromic lens when you are driving, actually your uh, mirror, uh, your windscreen already tinted with mm -hmm. the UV. Right. And then when you drive use the photochromic lens it's the uh, the, the color not so dark oh so the color won't, won't, yeah. won't it won't darken of too course much. it's depend on the uh, uv exposure right and and oh, that also comes with help from the windshield of your car uh, but but if you they have uh, they have the technology which uh, the new lens that uh, it changed a, a little bit color due to heat also mm -hmm. then when you drive uh, it's 25% uh, looks like tinted, tinted right, color. Right. So when you talk about photochromic lenses, uh, transition lenses, uh, the other question would be there's so many in the market, yeah. how do I choose? Uh, you choose uh, depend on, uh, normally uh, we as a practitioner always uh, recommend the best product to our consumer. Mm. Yeah. You, you recommend the best product? The to best product in, and yeah. to the so consumer so and, and, and uh, the color depend on uh, 
on uh, what she going to do. Mm -hmm. Let, let's say some want to have a, a very dark lens, so we uh, we, we recommend the, the extra extra active we call. Mm -hmm. So the lens change a bit faster. Right. You were also talking about green lenses now and various colors that are available. Mm -hmm. So I've n I've never seen them. So how do they work? Do they work the same? The green lenses, the uh, uh, orange lenses, so on and so forth. They is all is all this uh, this lens normally uh, choose by uh, customer preferred uh, what the color they want they the want the they want to, they want to use. yeah because yeah. uh, some want uh, just a shade lens some just want the contrast should be better when they use the uh, mm -hmm. transition or photochromic lens mm -hmm. now uh, what what would be your takeaway Mohammed to uh, the viewers of uh, Medical Today with regards to eye health, what would you like us to think about when we uh, go out and get our eyes checked or when we get uh, eyeglasses? I want to emphasize that uh, the eye protection should be our uh, key priorities. Uh, everybody should take note about this. Uh, we need to keep our eyes healthy and uh, to get a clear visual perception. Uh, due to the fact that every day we cannot uh, we we rely on digital device a lot so uh, like a computer cell phone and uh, large screen it's almost impossible to stop uh, people to use this device but please take a good care uh, good care to your eyes by wearing uh, a pair of glasses with the a lens coating to filter UV and blue light. Also can use a photochromic when you are active, indoors and outdoors. So you no need to, to uh, carry uh, two pair of glasses mm -hmm. all the time. Cause it makes in, better sense yeah, to have just one. Yeah. Instead, uh, indoors, so you, it's turn, uh, the length is clear when you go out. It's mm -hmm. turn darker. It's uh, very good for the active person. Right. Yeah. Then, uh, then, uh, Sunglass also a uh, best way to, uh, to, to protect your eyes when you do the activity under the hot sun. My advice is uh, it's better uh, to see an optometrist uh, to have the eye examination at least once a year mm -hmm. to get the eye test and uh, consultation as well. But right. we optometrists from OptoCare always uh, uh, provide the comprehensive eye test to our uh, consumer. Mm -hmm. So uh, that, that's, mm -hmm. there's your takeaway from uh, Muhammad. He talks about an eye test every year. Yeah. Get your eye test done once a year. And if you're going to get eyeglasses or get a recommendation, you need to get it from, from an optometrist. Yeah. yeah? yeah. Uh, Inchi Muhammad, thank you very much for yeah, joining us. You. It was a pleasure to have you on the show. We just spoke to the CEO of OptoCare, Muhammad bin Juso, helping us with eye protection for better eye health right here on Medical Today. We'll be back just after a short break. Stay with us. I have a vision correction number, but I'm more than a number. When I'm not teaching courses, I'm taking steeper grades and tight corners. My SLR lenses go beyond my correction. They make my vision as sharp as my reflexes to capture every detail from near to far at any speed. I'm more than a number. I'm a rapidly focusing champion of courses. See more, do more. SLR. Ask your eye care expert for advice. a vision correction number but I'm more than a number when I'm not enjoying my little sunshine I'm enjoying my city's modern architecture my Essilor lenses go beyond my correction their creasel technology shields my eyes from reflections scratches and smudges for optimal clarity I'm more than a number I'm a crystal clear catcher of the perfect image see more do more Essilor
Ask your eye care expert for advice. Hello, ladies, and welcome back to Medical Today with me, Jared Rutnam. Uh, from uh, what we spoke about just now, we move into diseases of the respiratory system. And if you're a smoker, you need to be wary of COPD, better known as chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Uh, it apparently affects 500,000 Malaysians. And uh, our on-site host, Narata Amin, spoke to two doctors, Dr. Ashok Philip, who is a resident consultant, and Dr. Wan Haniza Wan Muhammad, who is also a resident consultant from Makota Medical Center about COPD. Let's take a look at that interview. Welcome to Medical Today, Dr. Ashok Philip. So today we're going to talk about COPD. Um, what is COPD? I myself would like to know. And why is there a lack of awareness among Malaysians, especially when there is an estimated of 500,000 people uh, who are suffering from it? Uh, first of all, let me say that chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD, is a disease which develops over quite a long time, affects the airway passages, and affects the lung mainly. And why there is less awareness of it among the public is difficult to say, but perhaps because it's not one of those glamorous diseases, not one of those diseases which uh, has sympathetic sufferers, mm -hmm. because it's mostly older people who've been smoking all their lives. And that might be one of the reasons. Right. So does it affect non-smokers as well? Oh, definitely. It does affect non-smokers, but a much smaller proportion. Probably less than 10% of sufferers will be non-smokers. So what are the differences between COPD and asthma? Asthma is also an obstructive lung disease, but it's acute. It, uh, it usually starts in much younger life, often in childhood. It's characterized by episodes of difficulty in breathing and wheezing. But once that episode has been treated and is over, the lung function is normal. Whereas when you have chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, there's a fixed obstruction. Even in between severe episodes, if you check the lung function or if you ask the patient, there will be symptoms or there will be abnormalities on testing. So chronic is there all the time. Asthma is acute. In between episodes, you're perfectly normal. All right. So, um, Dr. Ashut, you mentioned earlier that it affects mostly the elderly. That's why probably it's not a popular disease among Malaysians. So COPD conditions normally affect uh, people for each group. What do you mean by elderly? 30 plus, specifically? Um, it usually will start, depends on how heavily they smoke, if mm -hmm. they are smokers. It usually starts somewhere in middle age to late middle age, 40s perhaps. And then it gets worse as they get older. If they continue to smoke, it'll get worse much faster. And you're talking about Malaysians, right? All people. Uh, yes. Oh, okay. But how, how about um, Malaysians uh, in, in Malaysia? It starts usually in the 40s. The 40s. And then mm -hmm. As you get older, you'll get more and more of that cohort of smokers if they continue to smoke, if they survive, mm -hmm. you'll get more of them having COPD. Okay. So, um, what triggers it and what are the symptoms or the warning signs? So, symptoms. you want to make sure that yeah. 500,000 people, <laughs> the number actually decrease. Yeah. Well, what triggers it usually? If they are smokers, and most of the time it's a cigarette smoking. Over a long period of time, the toxins in the smoke damage the lining of the lungs, make the lungs harder, more fibrosed. And what are the symptoms? It usually starts off with the, what we call the smoker's cough. You know, smokers, they will tend to cough, especially in the mornings. They may have a little bit of sputum brought up. And as it gets worse, they will cough more, they will become more breathless especially at first when they're doing a bit of exercise, when they walk around, when they climb stairs, they may get breathless. Mm -hmm. But as it gets worse, even at rest, they may be breathless. They are more likely to get infections as well because their lungs, the inside is damaged, mm -hmm. so they can't fight off infection. And so they more frequently get lung, lung infections, pneumonias. Right. So can a person have asthma and COPD at the same time? Strictly speaking, if you have asthma, you may develop COPD. Okay. But once you have COPD, it's not asthma anymore. Oh, it's, so if it's... your asthma is not well treated uh -huh. when you're young, 
So it's a worse stage of asthma. Yes, if it's not well that. treated, then you get a fixed obstruction of COPD. Right. Okay, so why is asthma reversible and COPD isn't? Asthma basically is an inflammation within the lungs. Usually it's caused by some form of abnormal immune reaction. So it starts off as just swelling of the lining of the airways. Mm -hmm. And when you treat it properly, the swelling goes off. It's completely back to normal. But if you don't treat it properly, that inflammation will slowly cause the lining of the airways to become hardened, fibrous. So once it's hardened like that, it's not possible for it to go back to normal. So right. that is why COPD is not reversible, asthma is. So looking at the conditions and the stages that you mentioned, yeah, the defects, is COPD considered a disability? It certainly can be. Oh. Because COPD, of course, is a spectrum of illness. Maybe having very mild COPD, you just cough a bit to get breathless. If you climb up two flights of stairs, that wouldn't be a disability. But as it goes on, even if you climb one flight of stairs, you become breathless. Even at rest, you become breathless. Then it's definitely a disability. You cannot do your work normally. Right. So how to prevent it, doctor? It seems serious. To prevent COPD. To prevent COPD, the best thing to do is not to smoke. Mm -hmm. If you do smoke, stop. Because if you haven't developed, then you're not likely to develop if you stop smoking. To prevent worsening of the disease, again, stop. But when you stop, it doesn't continue to get worse. So the basic thing I have to say is stop smoking. Of course, not everyone who has COPD is a smoker. Some of them are asthmatics. Some of them have genetic conditions that may cause that, but you can't those people cannot prevent the disease. But, but the smokers definitely can and they should. And it also affects the, the secondhand smokers, yes, right? Yes, it affects their families, it affects their friends, mm -hmm. it affects everyone in the vicinity. And you, you are talking about any types of smoking? Definitely any kind of smoking? Definitely cigarette smoking and uh, shisha or hookahs, yes. Vape, we are not so sure of yet oh. because it's just too, too new for us to tell. It's probably less harmful than smoking, but it's not as good as not smoking. And uh, as far as cigars and pipes go, probably they're not so bad for COPD. So what's your best advice, Dr. Acho, to the half million people in Malaysia who are suffering from COPD? The first thing is to the smokers. Stop smoking. That is uh, absolutely essential. Because some of them might say, look, I've already got COPD, why should I stop? But the thing is that if you're smoking, your lung function declines quite steeply. If you're not smoking, it's a very slow decline. If you stop, that steep decline becomes much more gradual. So it is always worth it to stop smoking. Secondly, seek medical treatment. Initially, you may go and see your GP. But I must stress that you should always go to the same GP. Do not do what most Malaysians do. The minute they're not getting better after the second day, they go to another doctor and then another doctor. So it's very important to seek consistent and stable treatment. And then anytime your symptoms worsen, go immediately to see the doctor. Because this is not a sort of condition that you can treat by yourself you can get very sick very fast. Within how many days, doctor? Well, if they start getting symptoms and they're not getting better within a couple of days, and I really mean a couple of days, two days, mm -hmm. three days maximum, go to the doctor. Because this condition can worsen extremely fast. Because pe people with COPD have got very poor defenses in their lungs. So something that you or I would shake off and bring them to, to the edge of the grave. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Ashok Philip, for uh, being with us today on Medical Today. So that was about COPD and not Thank you. Today we're going to learn about EBUS, endobronchial ultrasound. 
EBUS is a minimally invasive but highly effective procedure used to diagnose lung cancer, infections and other diseases. With Medical Today, we have Dr. Wan Haniza, Wan Muhammad, to enlighten us with procedures and to convince you that EBUS is the way moving forward. Hello, Dr. Haniza. How are you? I'm good. Thank you very much. All right. So what is an EBUS scan? EBUS scan is a procedure uh, to diagnose lung conditions. Uh, we use a special bronchoscope whereby there is an ultrasound scan probe attached at the end of the bronchoscope and we can visualize or we can look at um, airway wall structures or any structures adjacent to the airway and take samples from the structures. All right, so what are the difference between EBUS and a bronchoscope? A bronchoscope or bronchoscopy is uh, an endoscopic procedure uh, whereby we use a normal bronchoscope and this would allow us to visualize the airway itself and we can take samples from the airways and also take some samples from the lungs. Whereas an EBUS, it has an ultrasound scan, ultrasound probe at the end of the bronchoscope. Uh, so that's the difference. Mm -hmm. So is this new application, um, sorry, is this application new or widely used in Malaysia currently? Bronchoscopy is something that's been, that's, that's available for quite a long time, but EBUS is relatively new. Um, it's available in, bronchoscopy is available in most hospitals in Malaysia, but EBUS is available in some of the government hospitals in Malaysia. In private hospitals, if I'm not mistaken, there, there are only three centres offering the service oh. and one of them is Makwata Medical Centre. Okay. Of course. <laughs> so, what are the indications for EBUS and a bronchoscopy? Bronchoscopy is used to diagnose unresolved pneumonias or lung infections. We can also use it to diagnose lung masses. With a bronchoscopy, we can do um, bronchial washing where we can take samples like fluid samples from the lungs itself. We can also take uh, biopsy samples from the airway and also from the lungs itself by means of an endobronchial biopsy or a transbronchial biopsy. EBUS is a procedure that we use to look at abnormalities in the airway wall um, and also any structures adjacent to the airway wall such as a lymph node or a lung mass. We do an ultrasound scan when we do an EBUS to, to visualize these structures um, better and we can puncture to get samples from these structures to diagnose any abnormalities. So doctor, is there any risk? Both are generally safe procedures. Um, the risk that I tend to explain to my patients are uh, during the procedure they would get a cough for obvious reasons because we are going into a sensitive part of the airway, of the lungs. They can also get a sore throat. Um, with patients who undergo a bronchial washing, sometimes they can develop a fever. When we do a biopsy, they can uh, have some bleeding. So that would present with a bit of uh, blood when they cough after the procedure. But normally those are quite self-limiting. We would monitor patients' conditions during these procedures, looking at their blood pressure, their oxygen levels and their heart rate. Uh, we, we, and we could look at the patient's condition as well during the procedure. In, certain, in some patients who's got chronic lung disease, such as chronic obstructive lung disease, we have to be a bit careful when we do these procedures because they are at risk of developing respiratory failure, um, especially when we use too much sedation for them. So, what is a bronchoscopy usually used to diagnose? Bronchoscopy is, is used to diagnose unresolving pneumonias or lung infections. Okay. We can also use it to diagnose lung masses as well. Mm -hmm. uh, we do bronchial washings to get samples, fluid samples from the lungs and we send it off to the lab. 
or we can do biopsies from the airway itself called endobronchial biopsy or we can do uh, biopsies from the lung itself called a transbronchial lung biopsy. Alright, so how long do a bronchoscopy and uh, an EBUS procedure take? Bronchoscopy normally takes about 10 to 20 minutes depending on complexity. Okay. It doesn't take that long because it's quite a straightforward procedure. Mm -hmm. EBUS, in my opinion, is more complex because it requires us to identify certain anatomy in the airway with the ultrasound. It, it would take sometimes between one to two hours. It can take up to one to two hours. All right. Okay. So how long does it take to recover from a bronchoscopy, doctor? Um, it, it, it shouldn't take that long. Um, normally, it would take about perhaps 15 to 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. But EBUS, if the doctor uses more sedation, the patient may take longer, perhaps up to 30 minutes. Certain patients with chronic kidney disease, they may take longer because they take longer to clear up the, med the, the sedation from their system. Okay, so doctor, why would you recommend this clinical application? EBUS is a safe procedure. It's minimally invasive. Patients do not have to stain overnight as it can be done as a day case and is effective in diagnosing lung conditions. All right, thank you, Dr. Haniza, for being with us on Medical Today. You're welcome. That was Medical Today's Nurata Amin speaking to Dr. Asho Philip and Dr. Wan Haniza Binti Wan Muhammad, resident consultants from Makota Medical Center with regards to COPD or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or diseases of the respiratory system. Stay with us right here on Medical Today. We're going to take a short break and come back with more for you in our next segment. I have a vision correction number, but I'm more than a number. When I'm not sharing ideas with my colleagues, I'm defending my kingdom on the back of a dragon. My eyes and lenses go beyond my correction. They keep my eyes relaxed to stay focused and protect me from harmful blue light. I'm more than a number. I'm the never tired dragon eye. Eyes and Ask your eye care professional. See more. Do more. Essie Law. a vision correction number, but I'm more than a number. When I'm not teaching courses, I'm taking steeper grades and tight corners. My SLR lenses go beyond my correction. They make my vision as sharp as my reflexes to capture every detail from near to far at any speed. I'm more than a number. I'm a rapidly focusing champion of courses. See more, do more. SLR. Ask your eye care expert for advice. Welcome back to the final segment of Medical Today with me, Jared Ratnam, right here on BNC. Every week uh, on our second season or in our second season, we try to bring you a video. And today we're going to talk about a frozen shoulder. Most of us have experienced a frozen shoulder, some worse than the rest. But how do you deal with a frozen shoulder? Well, in our accidents and incidents video segment, we've got a little uh, tip for you or a couple of tips for you with regards to a frozen shoulder and how you can deal with it. First aid video with regards to frozen shoulder brought to you by the Regency Specialist Hospital. Let's take a look at that video about frozen shoulders.
so today I'm going to demonstrate some exercises that may be helpful for those who are having frozen shoulder. Basically, frozen shoulder have three phases, which are freezing, frozen, and thawing. Patient that having frozen shoulder will have stiffness towards their shoulder joint that may limit their shoulder movement at every direction. So the purpose of this exercise is actually to increase the range of motion of the shoulder joint and improve the mobility of the shoulder joint itself. So the first exercise we call it as pendulum exercise. So in this exercise, you just need a chair or anything that's stable enough for you to support yourself so that you can maintain your balance. Okay, so your strong hand. So for this patient, the affected hand is on the right side. So your strong hand needs to be on the chair while your affected hand needs to be in hanging position. So in this exercise, there are three movements, which are upward, which are forward and backward, sideway, in and out, and also circular motion. So we start first with the first movement, which is forward and backward. So you need to move your body as well, so that the movement can occur in your shoulder joint. Okay, so you can move your body forward and backward, forward and backward, good. So we move on to the second movement, which is sideway. Sideway in and out. You have to remember you to you have to move your body as well. In and out. So the last movement is circular motion. So for this circular motion, you may start first with a small circle, and as you feel comfortable with your shoulder joint, you can make the circle bigger. Yes, good. So for this exercise, you can repeat 10 times for each movement and you can do 3 sets in a day. Okay, so before we proceed to the second exercise, let us move the chair. So for second exercise, we call it as stick exercise. You just need a stick for this exercise. Okay. In this exercise, there are five movements which are upward, sideway, backward, internal rotation and also external rotation. So you need to remember that your non-affected hand must be at the bottom of the stick while your affected hand, which is your painful shoulder, need to be on the top of the stick. Okay. So the first movement is upward movement. So your strong hand need to push the stick upward. Yes, good. So hold it there for 15 seconds. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Relax. Good. So the second movement is sideway. So just move the stick to the sideway. Yes, good. Relax and hold it there from one to fifteen. Good. Relax. And the second movement is backward. Okay, move the stick backward and hold from 1 to 15. Good. Relax. And the next movement is external rotation. So for this movement, you need to remember, you need to make sure your arm must be close with your body throughout the movement. Okay. So move the stick sideways with your arm close with your body and hold from 1 to 15. Good. Relax. Okay. The last movement is internal rotation. So the bottom hand is the affected hand, which is the painful shoulder. And use the strong hand to lift up the stick so your affected hand can go up. Yes. Good and hold from 1 to 15. Okay, relax. So that's it for our exercise. So it is advisable for you to consult with your doctor if the frozen shoulder persists. Thank you. Well, that was a video about frozen shoulders uh, right here on Medical Today. And that uh, video was brought to you by the Regency Specialist Hospital. Uh, and if you do occur any emergencies or if you do come across any emergencies, uh, please call 999 and be sure to report it in before 
you uh, start first aid. In the meantime, if you do have any questions for us, do send us an email. Send it to Medical Today, or rather ASK at medicaltoday.my. That's ASK at medicaltoday.my. And we'll be more than happy to get subject matter experts to answer your questions right here on the show. In episode 10, which is next week, we'll be speaking to Dr. Go Kwang Yi. He's a resident consultant in neurology and internal medicine. His special interest is in Parkinson's disease and movement disorders. We'll also be having a patient in the studio uh, and a physiotherapist. His name is Hamaswani, and they'll be talking about uh, something very, very interesting right here on uh, Medical Today. Uh, with that, I'm Jared Rutnam signing off. You have a fantastic day ahead and have a splendid week. Bye-bye.